Good morning, everyone. I'm Heather Gallegos, Chairwoman of the Saginaw County Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors, and I want to welcome everyone back to the Perk Breakfast Zoom. To get started, I want to share some Zoom logistics for today's program. We recommend you view this perk in speaker mode to get the best flow and the, la or the least distraction. We'll be muting everyone except the designated speaker during the program. But don't worry, this is a perk. So we have built in time for a business card Zoom exchange about halfway through. I do wanna let you know that we'll have a video in today's program and we'll be sharing our screen and sound to allow you to hear it. Sometimes it can be a little loud depending on your own sound settings um, and devices. So be aware that you may need to adjust the, the uh, sound volume when it plays. And now let's begin our program with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all. You should have received our regular PERC brochure attached to your login email for the program. In it, you'll find information on today's new members, and since it's digital, it will be right there at your fingertips whenever you want it. The Chamber offers a variety of tools for you to use as you work to reopen or increase your business connections and bottom line. The PERC brochure is one of the chamber benefits, in, excuse me, and chamber benefits are another. Chamber benefit partners provide comprehensive benefit programs for members of the Saginaw County Chamber of Commerce. The chamber endorses their products and services, and they help support the chamber's quality of life, community initiatives, and member service programs. Because you belong, these value-added benefits can save you both time and money. Benefits like utility and telecommunications analysis and savings, identity theft protection, and Michigan federal and federal labor law posters from Chamber Benefit Partner, Michigan Chamber of Commerce, can all be yours through your Saginaw County Chamber of Commerce membership. Learn more about these and other member benefits on the Chamber's website at www.saginawchamber.org. And now, please join me in welcoming our 2020 Chamber Ambassador Chair, Dawn Boucher from Manor Group. Dawn? Thank you, Heather. Good morning, everyone, and a special welcome to all of our newest Chamber members today. We're so happy you could join us. Especially now, it's important to support each other and lift up our local business community. And partnering with the Chamber is a great way to do just that. It gives you access to a local support network for information, best practices, new business leads, and communication and connection opportunities. So let's meet our new members. First up this morning is KLH Group LLC. KLH Group LLC offers leadership training and coaching for both groups and individuals, systems development and implementation, and project management utilizing the methods and approach of a certified John Maxwell team member. Welcome to the Chamber. Next we have Forex Filtration Group. Forex Filtration Group is an independent medical and cosmetic grade polyurethane foam products producer based in Virginia with manufacturing plants in the Great Lakes Bay region. They serve a device diverse global market. Forex customizes foam products, including personal care and cosmetic foams for businesses around the world. Welcome to the chamber. And our final member this morning is Sombrero's Mexican Restaurant. Sombrero's Mexican Restaurant is an authentic Tex-Mex restaurant located in Saginaw and serving the Great Lakes Bay region. 
Sombreros features daily specials and offers a complete menu on Facebook. Visit their page today. Welcome to the chamber. And now, Heather, it's back to you. Thanks so much, Dawn, and welcome again to all of our new members. At this time, I'd like to thank our 2020 Premier Perk sponsors. These are the organizations that make the Percolator Breakfast possible by underwriting all 10 of our events during the year. All of our 2020 Premier Perk sponsors are included on your screen and on the back of your Perk brochure. We encourage you to thank them for supporting the Percolator Breakfast and support them with your business whenever possible. At each perk, we like to highlight a few of these noble sponsors and tell you a little bit about them. And I'd like to do that right now. First up, Caravan Facilities Management, LLC. Caravan Facilities Management was established in 1997 as a certified minority business. With corporate headquarters in Saginaw, Caravan has grown to be one of the industry's top performers in the United States. Whether you're looking for basic janitorial services, building maintenance, or any of a wide range of integrated facility services, Caravan can take care of that. Caravan also implements and produces cost-saving strategies throughout the facilities while creating safe work environments. At Caravan, they'll take care of that. Thank you, Caravan Facilities Management. Next up, we welcome Great Lakes Bay, Michigan Works. Great Lakes Bay, Michigan Works is more than a funding source, a spare pair of hands to post jobs and sort resumes, and they are not the unemployment office either. Because of their direct interaction with employer customers, they have become collaborators, connectors, innovators, and best equipped with resources, knowledge, experience, and manpower to help employers with customized solutions for challenging recruitment projects. Thank you, Great Lakes Bay Michigan Works. And now we welcome Independent Bank. For 150 years, Independent Bank has worked hard to earn the business and the trust of those across Michigan. Customers have been their focus since the day they opened their doors and doing whatever it takes to meet customer needs has always been their top priority. Be independent. Thank you, Independent Bank. Next is Saginaw Valley State University. Go Cardinals, I'm an alum, that's my alma mater. Saginaw Valley State University is preparing to have students return to campus this fall under the Cardinal Nest Plan. Nest stands for New Expectations for a safer tomorrow. Most classes will be taught with face-to-face -face instruction and SBSU's plan is built around five safety practices. Number one, a daily health self-screening. Two, wearing masks when indoors. Three, practicing social distancing. Four, proper hand washing. Five, being considerate of others. SVSU is proud of their many alumni who are on the front lines of responding to the current crisis. Thank you, Saginaw Valley State University. And finally this morning, we have STT Security and Investigations. STT Security Investigations is the Great Lakes Bay Region Specialist in Professional Security Guard Services, Investigation, Surveillance, employee background screening, employee terminations, security counseling, and business training. STT is also a full service agency suited to support nearly any type or size of business with dedicated risk management services. Contact STT today for, no, for a no obligation consultation. Thank you, STT and investigations. And now it is time for today's community update with your chamber president and mine, Veronica Horn. Veronica, it is all yours, my friends. Thank you so much, Chairwoman Gallegos. 
And thank you everybody for joining us today for this uh, special perk. Um, before we get into our community, our community um, update, I just want to reiterate to all of you that the Chamber of Commerce does support the Mask Up program. We want to get back to work. We do not want to take a step back and we don't even want to be where we are right now. We don't want to see an uptick. So please, whether you agree with this or not, wearing a mask has proven to be safe, lowers our, our, our you know, the threat of, of either giving someone a virus or getting the virus yourself. So everyone, please mask up and be considerate with one another. Um, we want to announce that the Chamber will continue to provide our events virtually as we all wind through the ups and downs of the COVID pandemic. Once it's deemed safe for larger events again, though you can be sure that we'll be back together in person, hopefully sooner rather than later. Until then, we hope you'll continue to join us for Perk Breakfasts, Big Strategies for Small Business, and legislative events through your favorite communications device. And with that in mind, please mark August 13th on your calendar for our virtual take on our annual meeting. Watch your email for more details. The Chamber is working with a small group coordinated by Dow on an inclusion and diversity project. We're really excited about this. Um, we're in the beginning phases, and, but there will be more information on that project plans as, as we get them completed and in place. The Chamber Screening and Endorsement Committee met and virtually interviewed individuals who approached the Chamber for endorsement in the upcoming primary elections. The committee forwarded its recommendations to the Chamber Board of Directors for a vote, and it's my pleasure to announce that the Saginaw County Chamber of Commerce is endorsing a yes vote on the Castle Millage Museum renewal. We are also endorsing incumbent Mike Hanley for Saginaw County Clerk, and Katie Albasta Kelly for Saginaw County Register of Deeds. And we ask that you consider our endorsements when you, when you cast your vote in the upcoming August 4th primary election. We're still planning on holding a real live golf classic on Tuesday, September 22nd at the Swan Valley Country Club. We will focus on safe distancing and supply plenty of hand sanitizer for participants, sponsors, and volunteers at our limited contact outdoor outing. May the course be with you. We invite you to register for Golf Wars on the Chamber's website, and if you're interested in sponsorships, please contact Susan Moody. Speaking of Susan Moody, the American Chamber of Commerce Executives has awarded Susan of the Saginaw County Chamber of Commerce with its Dana Kettering Lifetime Sales Achievement. Susan placed with a silver award honoring a minimum of 750 transactions and over $300,000 in lifetime new personal sales among chambers with annual membership dues income between $200,000 and $500,000. Congratulations to our own Susan, that's quite an accomplishment. And finally, we'd like to give a shout out to two groups who have gone to great lengths to, to highlight and promote the city of Saginaw. The Great Mural Project has completed another fantastic mural project under the Court Street Bridge. And if you haven't had a chance to see it in person, we encourage you to take a little drive and take a look for yourself. It's just, it's beautiful. Also, the statues are back, and, and, but they're different than the last time. Once again, Art and About has commissioned the placement of statues depicting everyday life in a variety of locations in the Riverfront Saginaw District. You received a location map with your PERC email today, so take some time to visit them all and take some pictures. If you send them to us, we might even share them on our Facebook page. And now before we introduce today's featured presenters, I'd like to share a video from today's speaker sponsor, the Great Lakes Bay Region Convention and Visitors Bureau. 
Did you know that tourism employs 10% of the Great Lakes Bay Region workforce? Here at your Great Lakes Bay Regional Convention and Visitors Bureau, we work to bring meetings, tournaments, and other event business here. Hosting these events brings hundreds of thousands of visitors into our region, spending millions of dollars in our local economy, keeping our people working. Now more than ever, we need you to help us bring more business home. We make it so easy and all of our services are free, but we don't want you to just take our word for it. Hear it straight from some of your peers. They are Great Lakes Bay region champions. Working with the Great Lakes Bay CVB for over five years now, I would recommend them to anyone without hesitation. They make you feel at home, even if you're not from this region. They know how to plan a party, an event, a conference, you name it. And they have so many ideas to give to you. You could have a plan in place, but they will bring something to the table that you will remember for a long time. Great Lakes Bay Convention and Visitors Bureau worked extremely well with both our local organizers for this uh, regional soccer event and also the Midwest regional people that had to be involved. Uh, numerous uh, conversations were taken and the thousands of rooms that were secured for our attendees, both players and families, was well received. Uh, the Great Lakes Bay Convention and Visitors Bureau did a fabulous job at convening this organization and helping those involved with it. Our tournament was so successful both in 2019 and 2012, I can only say to anyone who's considering using the Convention and Visitors Bureau capabilities here at the Great Lakes Bay Convention and Visitors Bureau to pick the phone up, give them a call because they were fabulous uh, with our organization and the results that we had were nothing but exemplary. I asked the OHL if we could have the, uh, the managers and marketing meeting here in the, in the second account in the Great Lakes Bay region. And they said yes, and uh, the teams all came here to Frankenmuth, and they had an extraordinary time. We have terrific facilities here, we have terrific people, uh, and they left here feeling a wow. They said we had a terrific time in Saginaw County. Uh, the event was perfectly managed and we had plenty of space. The food was terrific. All those things that you want to have in a meeting and a convention, uh, we were able to provide right here in the Great Lakes Bay region. We had 20 communities that left here saying, that was fun, I want to go back there again. There's no business too large or too small. Reach out to us here at the Great Lakes Bay Regional CVB and together, let's bring more business home. Wow, thank you today's speak to today's speaker sponsor, the Great Lakes Bay Regional Convention and Visitors Bureau. I can tell you they do a fantastic job. Today we're, we're going to have a serious topic. We'll be learning more about the Michigan budget. Uh, we're pleased to announce our speakers. Today we'll be uh, joining us today for an inside look is our state Senate Majority Leader, Mike Shirky, and our own Saginaw's Senator Ken Horn. In November 2014, residents of Michigan's 16th Senate District first elected Republican Senator Mike Shirky from Clark Lake to the State Senate, representing Branch, Hillsdale, and Jackson Counties. Senator Shirky's Republican colleagues elected Mike to serve as Senate Majority Leader for his second term beginning in January of 2019. Mike has served as Chair of the Senate Health Policy and Michigan Competitiveness Committees and he currently chairs the Government Operations Committee. Prior to joining the Senate, he served for four years in the Michigan House of Representatives, representing the 65th House District. Senator Shirky is the founder and owner of OrbitForm, a leading engineering company that manufactures forming, fastening, joining, and assembly equipment for a wide range of industries and applications. We would have room for a branch here in Saginaw County Senator, so keep that in mind. Uh, the company provides world-class prototype engineering services for assembly of parts and specialized forming and fastening. Mike also worked for General Motors in various management and engineering roles for 13 years. Mike served on the Columbia Central School Board in the 1980s and 1990s. He is also the past board chair of Allegiance Health System. State Senator Ken Horn was born in Detroit and is a first-generation American. He's lived in Frankenmuth for over 40 years, where he met his wife, me. <laughs> Ken, gra <laughs> Ken graduated from Concordia University with a Bachelor of Arts degree in criminal justice 
and was a small business owner for nearly 15 years, owning and operating Horn's Restaurant in Frankenmuth. In addition, he has served as a substitute teacher in Bridgeport and Frankenmuth schools. In 2004, Ken accepted the position of Vice President of Donor Services at the Saginaw Community Foundation, where he managed over 300 funds and oversaw a nearly 1.2 million grant programs that helped to improve Saginaw County. He was a Saginaw County Commissioner for 16 years, representing Birch Run, Bridgeport, and Frankenmuth Townships, as well as the City of Frankenmuth. He served as Chairman of the Legislative Subcommittee and also served on Courts and Public Safety, Community Corrections Advisory Board, County Services, Budget Audit Appropriations, Saginaw County Airport Commission, and the Saginaw County Event Center Board. In 2006, Ken was elected to serve the 94th District in the Michigan House of Representatives. From 2007 to 2012, he represented the cities of Birch Run, Chesting, Frankenmuth, and St. Charles, in addition to 12 townships in Saginaw County. Ken served as chairman of the House Energy and Technology Committee. Now in his second term in the Michigan Senate, Ken chairs the Senate Economic and Small <coughs> Business Development Committee, along with two Senate Appropriations Subcommittees, Capital Outlay and Talent and Economic Development, MEDC. He also serves as the vice chairman of the following committees, Energy and Technology, Education and Career Readiness, and the Appropriations Subcommittee on Universities and Community Colleges. He is also appointed to the Insurance and Banking Committee and Legislative Council. To start, please welcome Senator Ken Horn. Senator, it's all yours. Well, thank you, Madam President. Uh, we, Wally Brunner used to say after a long introduction, well, you've heard the eulogy, now you get to view the body. The, you know, if, it, it, we really do have to, honey, shorten up that, that bio and kind of kind of tighten it up a little bit. But <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't write it. <laughs> I didn't write it. Yeah. So, but listen, we're you know we're happy to be here with you today. I'm so proud to you know to uh, to be able to introduce uh, my colleague and our majority leader, Senator Mike Shirky, who's been uh, a good friend through you know through a, my entire. Uh, time working with him in the legislature. And, you know, this is a, Mike Shirky is a number one, uh, you know, calm and steady hand on the tiller of, you know, of the legislature. And so we're, we really count on him to, you know, to negotiate on our behalf and to, you know, to, to know all of the nuances. And, you know, in each of the senators, they all have, you know, big personalities that, uh, that Senator Shirky has to manage, and so he does an extraordinary job with this. and And today he's got for us just a just a very brief presentation on the budget. But what we'd like to do, I think, in you know, with um, and Mike, it you know, when you when you get your presentation done, just to be able to answer questions. And and and, I, and I'm not sure how Nancy and Lisa uh, want to handle uh, your know, questions, but we'll go into question and answer very quickly. Uh, just kind of find out what's on your minds. I know there, you know, there's just a lot of turmoil now in in terms of economics. I chair the Economic Development Committee. I've been trying to get our economy started safely, and you know, with, you know, and, and have uh, I understand the protocol and the health and behaviors that it's going to take to to start us up. Uh, but it's we're we're really as the state of Michigan kind of stumbling and and I want to make sure that you know that we get off on the right foot so that we're competitive with the states around us and, and frankly with nations around the world and, and with that let me introduce then uh, uh, Senate Majority Leader Mike Shirky to give you a, uh, a little bit of introduction of himself and uh, and then do our presentation and then we'll take uh, we'll have uh, uh, Veronica take it back from there. Senator, are you ready? We need to have, there we go. There we go, thank you. All right. Uh, thanks, Kenny, and thanks, Veronica. It looks like the, uh, the economic development gene doesn't fall too far from that, brown, that horn household. <clears throat> and uh, we're happy for that, both in the Saginaw Bay Area, but also in the Senate, the state of Michigan. This is a very quick overview 
And I think uh, Nancy is going to be uh, uh, indexing through it. You can go ahead to the next slide, Nancy. Thank you. This is a position that the, ca the caucus has taken uh, in terms of providing some input to our congressmen in, Mich in, uh, in, in uh, United States Congress regarding uh, federal money. Uh, as you know, we have received about $3.4 billion from federal money in Michigan so far, and it was very welcome and very needed. And uh, I believe Ken and I, along with our colleagues in the House and the Senate, have appropriately deployed that money. But we are also uh, wanting, to, wanting to send a very important message to Congress saying, listen, uh, we cannot bar ourselves out of this mess, and we gotta be careful not to, to quickly default to debt and call it a plan. And so there are some of the things that the federal government did in terms of uh, providing resources, I think we're very good. Uh, I'm, I suspect that some of the folks on this call would question with me uh, a couple of the moves, in particular the uh, unemployment uh, bonus, that with a little bit of with a couple of tweaks could have been very good, but it's caused a bit of an up, uproar in our uh, employment um, landscape, actually causing employee employers to have a difficult time finding people who want to go to work, and so we're asking them to be a little bit have a little restraint if they're contemplating doing that again. And just make it, make it commensurate to what, what, what somebody's income is if it's going to be uh, put in a form of a bonus. Go to the next slide there, Nancy, thank you. <clears throat> um, when this insidious virus hit our shores uh, this early in uh, February, we were enjoying great demand across the state of Michigan and frankly across the nation. And I maintain that that demand hasn't gone away. It was basically replaced by fear. And when we, when we enter into a stage of fear, you know, the demand goes on hold, but it doesn't go away. And now we're working through this fear. Uh, we resolved quickly to put a high priority in getting our budget, this year's budget, reconciled. And <clears throat> we, we creatively used the federal money to be able to do that in a way in which we were staying within the bounds of the requirements uh, provided and, uh, uh, and uh, outlined by the federal government. And frankly, we were able to not only uh, balance, uh, we're, we should approve it this coming week when we go back into session, but I think that all the, uh, all the questions and all the negotiations are pretty well done by now. Not only were we able to correct, provide a balanced budget for this year, but we were also able to provide some uh, bonus money to some of our, not just first responders, but also our frontline workers like teachers. And uh, all of us across both chambers thought that was very important because people have been working in very strange and challenging, and in some cases, dangerous conditions uh, since we went into this uh, uh, endeavor together on fighting this COVID virus. Go to the next uh, slide, please, Nancy. As I said, we received a little over $3 billion. We technically could not use that to backfill budget deficits, but we were able to use it creatively to for instance, advance money to schools for the deployment of distance learning. And so instead of it looking like it was uh, backfilling in a budget, we actually proactively said, here's funds that we know you spent on things like developing distance learning, and you had to do that on a dime. I mean, you didn't give, schools didn't get any notice. They were just told at a, at a given date that uh, we're shutting them down and you need to go immediately into distance learning mode. and We've got some terrific examples across the state where schools outperformed. And frankly, we've got some examples where uh, there needs to be a few lessons learned. Uh, but in, in, for the most part, uh, it was a quick conversion. And now we're into the, the uh, mode of trying to define what the guidelines are for this fall's school startup. Next slide, please, Nancy. I already mentioned that the teachers are going to receive a $500 one-time hazard pay uh, bonus for the work that they've done. Uh, we have did the best we could to deploy the, the monies available to us to help universities and local governments address their costs that are associated with the responding to the COVID-19 virus. And then uh, we increased our ability to prepare stockpiles of necessary PPE and testing facilities all these things done uh, in the context of providing a, a balanced budget format for this particular uh, budget year. Next slide, please. 
We also extended the tax deadlines, as you know, at the federal level, and we commensurately did that at the state level. And uh, and uh, and right now we are in the mode of moving from re reconciling the 2020 budget, the one we're currently in, which which uh, expires September, uh, yeah, September 30th, and then working on the next year's budget. Next slide, please. Well, I guess that's the last slide. Go back to that last slide then, Nancy. The most important point for me to make here is that uh, absent a bailout from Congress, and I've already talked about, we've provided some feedback to our, our representatives in Washington to be uh, a little more thoughtful in how they do that. But absent that, we are gonna be facing with some pretty interesting, uh, frankly, I would label them serious uh, challenges in this next year's budget. And that conversation starts well, it's already started, but it will start in earnest uh, next week after we've approved this year's budget. Um, we have challenges that we've never experienced before. Uh, and, and I know that uh, I share this with most of the folks on this call, because um, most of the folks on this call are either operating businesses or run businesses or own businesses. And uh, that's, all, that's what we all live and uh, breathe for. Um, and it's been a challenge. And we've been operating in a, in a mode of unilateral government uh, since our governor, our current governor, has uh, abused a law allowing her to do so for perpetuity. Uh, the Senate, Ken and I, and the Senate and the House have uh, initiated a lawsuit to challenge that in courts, uh, saying that the, you know, we've lost representative government, we've lost the balance of power, and we've been, uh, frankly, you know, working in, a, in an environment of a unilateral government where we've been governing by executive order. Executive orders basically have the, the uh, force of law until they're expired or until the emergency declaration expires. And uh, this governor has chosen to use that old 1945 law uh, and uh, continue to hold us in that mode. I believe it's time for us to challenge that now. I think that we've, we've gone from being in fear of this COVID virus to now learning to live with it. It doesn't mean the threats have gone away. It just means that we now know for the most part what we must do uh, to live with it. And I'm strongly encouraging and have, in fact had a conversation with our governor yet uh, this week saying it's time for us to get out of the emergency declaration and go back to the normal legislative process. Uh, I know we've all experienced, and I know you've all observed some of the ambiguities and absurdities even in some of the executive orders, which has caused problems across the spectrum, both from businesses and being able to understand what they can and can't do. Even citizens getting up in the morning, having to check an FAQ page at the Michigan.gov to see what they are allowed and not allowed to do. And then we've created a very confusing environment for law enforcement. And uh, as we've seen in the last, unfortunately, in the last couple of days of this week, by our governor um, exhorting citizens to challenge other citizens on this topic of masks, and I won't get into the topic of masks in terms of the pros and the cons, but we should never have an environment where we're expecting long, uh, citizens to, to, uh, to uh, act as law enforcement and challenge other citizens. And unfortunately, we had an occurrence this week already that resulted in an unfortunate and unnecessary death. And that's an example of what happens when we're operating under executive orders where one person is making all the decisions and there's no legislative input, no ability to debate, no ability to have process uh, important questions and important concepts through committees and no ability to improve and clarify. And so if you, if you can sense a bit of frustration in my voice, your, your antennas are properly tuned because it is frustration. And uh, we are endeavoring now to uh, move try to encourage her with all our shoulders and all our weight to move out of this uh, seemingly perpetual state of emergency into a normal process. And we can handle it now because we've all learned. So that's my opening comments. I don't want to take any more time because the richness of these interactions occur from the questions that are shared. And I'm uh, anxious to get into those. And so let's uh, turn the slide presentation off, Nancy, and let's uh, let Veronica uh, uh, handled some questions. Okay, thank you senators, both of you. Um, I think Nancy is going to enable the chat for everyone watching. If you have a question, please uh, type it in and I will relay it to either Senator Shirky or Senate Majority Shirky or Senator Horn. 
And I've got the chat up too. So if okay. uh, if we see questions, uh, Veronica, you and I, and you know, yep. say, be, between us, we can make sure that uh, the Senate Majority Leader can you know answer those as well. Okay. But you know, just kind of just to add on as we're waiting for you know for questions too. This this issue of oversight, you know, with uh, uh, you know with the governor in the state of emergency. You know, you think about an emergency room doctor, and you know, there's some accident, something happens. You're at the emergency room. You know, the doctor needs all the tools that they that they have at their disposal. You know, the best equipment, the you know, the best talent, and then you know, we you know, we stabilize you know anything that you know that's gone wrong in a you know whether it's a car accident or some other uh, some other thing that's happening, and and then we then we send you back into the you know into the hospital for you know for recovery. So you stabilize the emergencies over, but we still have to take good care of that patient. And, and that's really kind of what we've gone through is we've given the governor the ability and early on we, we had uh, little knowledge of this, this virus. It was, a, it was pretty scary. We thought our uh, emergency rooms were gonna get overloaded, that we didn't have enough equipment. And, and the governor needed the tools that, uh, that she had available to her to, you know, to manage the crisis. Well, we, we've learned a lot since then. And, you know, and if we don't manage this crisis together, then it's just one-sided. You know, there, you know, and I stated this on the Senate floor in a, you know, in a statement, just trying to, you know, to get, wrap our arms around what's really happening. And it's say, you know, when one person, you know, you know, at every waking thought can turn into law with a stroke of a pen, and then you know, uh, and then we in the Senate, we we passed out a piece of legislation, for example, a, just on our way out of a, the month of June, that would defer tax payments, property tax payments for you know for people and for businesses that were struggling, you know, you know, with no income and no cash flow. It doesn't mean you 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 don't have to pay your taxes. It just means that uh, you know they were delayed. The governor vetoed that bill, amongst others. And so she writes her laws, signs, you know, on her own, uh, without consent of the people, so to speak. Uh, we write laws and she vetoes them. This is not the way a democracy or a republic work. And, and, and so we need to take care of each other through this, you know, through this crisis, through this virus. Uh, to, and, and we are always learning something new. Uh, but in terms of governance, this is, a, this is way over the line, in my personal opinion. Okay, I don't see any questions coming in yet, but so now you're going to have to treat this Veronica like a leadership Saginaw. So you're going to be the moderator. Is that? Oh, I've got some tough questions for us. Uh, okay, bring up. Actually, <laughs> um, we don't want any pillow talk here now. <laughs> you guys can save that for later. <laughs> yeah, um, I actually do have a question for you, Senator Shirky. Well, how yes, is the relationship with the governor's office? Are you are you talking? Is there an effort to? You know, I know that. The House side, the Senate side, you know, have, have worked out their budgets for this year. Yeah. What's coming up? I mean, for, for a Chamber of Commerce in our position, we're more fearful for what's to come, like our next year's budget. Where is everyone going to be with this, you know, with this unknown? We're hoping we don't take a step back. We're hoping everyone takes precautions, that they wear a mask, that they do everything they can so that they're safe, their employees are safe, and the public is safe. But having said that, if we, you know, I don't even want to say take a step back, but even in the current position, we know that funds come in about 18 months behind for government, right? Behind the private sector. What are we looking at and what is the relationship with the governor's office over working together on this budget? So I'm going to give you a, a, a view into it, and there's some bad news, and then I think a, some glimmer of good news here. Uh, I haven't spoken personally in presence, in the presence of the governor since March 13th. Uh, we have spoken over the phone since then on a pretty regular basis. Uh, we have quadra meetings with the leadership of both the chambers and the governor, the executive office. Uh, and since uh, about May 1st, I've asked in every one of those meetings, when are we gonna get together and meet eyeball to eyeball? We can meet in a large conference room and be per perfectly safe to do so and the response today, so far, up till, to, up till this week even, was I'm not ready to do that yet. And so there's a reluctance to actually get together, and I'm disappointed in reporting that. Uh, but the, the sparkle of good news is that, that we were able to uh, negotiate 
not only the terms for reconciling the 2020 budget, the one we're currently in, mm -hmm. but also some beginning terms, Veronica, for the 21 budget. Okay. And, and we've agreed basically to stand down. I mean, it's going to be an economic challenge across the board. And there's no, there's no way for us to avoid some bad news. But sure. we've, agreed, we've agreed to not shoot at each other over the budget stuff. We're going to take serious shots on policy things yeah. and some of the decisions. But we're going to, we've agreed to not take shots at each other on trying to get, you know, re, uh, agreement on a budget. And we proved that the first step on reconciling this budget, and then we'll see how that comes to fruition on the second step. Okay, we've had several questions come in. I want to try and keep it to policy right now. So from the education community, I have a question. Is there a timeline for when the 2021 budget may be completed? We are especially concerned about the ability for K-12 and higher education to open for the fall and to have an idea of the finances they have to be able to work with? There is no higher priority right now than education clarity. None, not a single issue is more important than education clarity. The goal is to have um, a framework for a 2021 but to 21 budget uh, by the middle of the early August. And then we're gonna call for a unique revenue consensus, consensus estimate conference uh, in, in the middle of August to test whether or not the May projections are actually still true. There's some indication that revenue is actually a little ahead of what the May ex, ex, uh, estimates were. And so we're going to do that in uh, mid-August, which we don't, don't normally do. And then the target is to have the budget completed by September 7th, 7th, 8th, in that time frame. Now that doesn't give schools a lot of time. So before then, and I'm hoping we do this next week actually, uh, keep, your, keep your fingers crossed, provide some clarity for schools on how we're going to count. That's the first step. And then when we're going to count. And uh, there's some good ideas on it. I think the Senate and the House are pretty well aligned on, on how to do that. I've been talking, I had a meeting this week with a, a room full of superintendents and they were in agreement that the House and Senate's proposal uh, is something they can, they can actually work with. They need the certainty of knowing how to count. They already know there's going to be a bit of a, of a per pupil funding change. They've already started budgeting that, but the unknown that they don't know is how are they going to count? And why is that important? Because there's going to be a lot of people, a lot of parents who are still uncertain whether they're going to actually send their kids to school and sit in the seat or they're going to keep them at home and do distance learning. Okay. And then when you come, when you got that hybrid model going on, that is, uh, is, is, that has not been properly implemented into our accounting process heretofore. Uh, but, so that's why we got to change the uh, thing. My, I'm advocating for, and I believe Senator Horn is, uh, is with me on this, we, we, um, we basically use last year's count to begin the school year, adjusted for expected uh, attrition every year. We, you know, we aren't making enough babies in the state. We need to make more babies, but I'll, I'll leave that, to, I'll leave that to, uh, to <laughs> I'll leave that to, uh, to another topic, but using last year's count, uh, counting for attrition and having that be the starting point for schools, I think is the most sensible way for us to do it. Uh, but uh, that, there, I can assure you there is no higher priority right now than providing clarity for our schools. Yeah, and I can, I can back that up. And let's talk a little bit about the policy of opening up our schools, too. The, you know, I, with, it was uh, Senator Shirky that, uh, that really uh, pushed this notion of, a, of pay for teachers above and beyond. I mean, they, this is such an extraordinary time. Uh, but here's here's what we're looking at, and we it, we have they have some superintendents on uh, with us today, Good. but and, and some educators. But the, a, but do we send kids in full classrooms? Do we divide them up? Do we stagger classes? Do we make classrooms smaller? We've got an we've got an influx of teachers that are retiring. They're looking at uh, you know at retiring early. We already have a teacher shortage. If we if we expand the number of classrooms because we're making them smaller, are we going to have enough teachers to begin with? And if we don't open up our our schools, you know, on our uh, on a regular schedule this fall, then do parents get out of the habit of sending their kids to school? They, you know, if they're going to do distance learning, are they going to pick different schools that you know are a little bit more nimble or a little more flexible? Parochial schools, and charters, private schools. These are these are real questions, and so seat you know the the seat count is a, a top priority. 
you know, until we get a handle on how we're going to, uh, how we're going to do this. And, and really there's a very little guidance from the governor's office and she has all the control on this. And so we're, you know, we're, we're all still kind of, you know, kind of scrambling to figure out how we're going to get this fall going. Okay. Here's a question um, that uh, I just, so that the audience knows I am unable to open up everybody's questions. I'm not able to see them. So I am getting a few in and I'm going to try and field those, but just understand I'm having some kind of technical thing going on here. Um, from, from someone in our audience, uh, for both of you, uh, if we have an uptick in positive tests and hospitalizations in the fall, do you both feel that the governor will be quick to shut us down again? What's your sense? I mean, what's your sense? Well, we have an uptick in positive tests already. I believe that's related to two things. One, a dramatic and a necessary increase in the number of tests, and also the fact that people are getting out and getting around. Um, and I think it's something that we should expect. If you look nationally at the graph of positive test increases and then compare that, superimposing that same graph, hospitalizations and deaths, they diverge from one another. In other words, number of cases is going up and deaths and hospitalizations is going down. And why is that important? Is because that's my proof, that's my anecdotal proof, that we're now learning to live with this, not in fear of it. Um, you know, until we have a vaccine, which, you know, there's, there's even parties who think that we can't, we'll never have a vaccine uh, for this one that's very effective. I'm not gonna opine on that. I'm just saying until we have that, we have to learn to live with it. And so I don't believe that uh, she's gonna be very quick to ratchet us back to a shutdown because for quite frankly, if she did, um, our budget issues would, would grow exponentially and it's unnecessary. It's unnecessary. We know how to do this now. We know how to act and we can go back, we can get out of the emergency declaration form because Ken and I and our colleagues in the House and Senate, we're not going to go wild west. We know we still need to have safety precautions and controls in. Um, but right now, uh, Veronica, I can't see, if she, if she were to go back backwards to phase three or worse, um, I, think, uh, I think the, the uh, natives would become very restless. Well then, and it, and it kind of dovetails into this question. So what is a return to normal in your eyes? Either one of you can answer that. Go ahead, Kenny. Well, I think a return to normal is, is uh, working with employers, working with their employees, whether they're, you know, we have so many nonprofits and, you know, government officials on this, you know, on this call as well, business owners and managers. It's, it's going to be employers and employees employees uh, getting together saying this is how we're going to run our business and you know and taking care of their customers so restaurants know they need certainty and it, normal would be you know just you you can spread out your tables you can eat outside you can use masks you can use social distancing but if you shut down you know here look at what happened in in Saginaw in, in old town Saginaw and you we had a couple of members that that were hit really hard loaded up their inventory before St. Patty's Day, two days before told that they couldn't open. We did a liquor buyback. I've got the bill to, you know, to, um, uh, you know, to uh, codify the governor's uh, liquor buyback rule, right? Because we think that that was one of the good EOs. And, uh, and then uh, you load up right before the, the summer 4th of July break. And, and then you're told you can't sell liquor across the bar again. And so now your inventory sits. You, you know, if, you know, if Tommy Miller over at Jimmy Meinberg has got a hundred uh, beers on tap, every one of them is going to go sour in this time. And he's going to have to do this twice. He doesn't, who has that kind of cash? So certainty is going to be a, a clarity of which we haven't had from the very first executive order. Uh, you know, there, it's a lack of clarity and businesses and people need, need certainty in their lives, whether they like, you know, the, the answers they're getting or not. Uh, normal would be, to me, normalcy would be uh, uh, providing certainty. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, does the state have an official policy on how the deaths are tallied? And we've had, heard a lot of questions about that. If someone is in hospice care or in a car accident, but at the time of death test positive for COVID, those are considered COVID deaths? And is that inflating uh, the numbers? Is it confusing the numbers? 
I want to, I'm going to take this from Kenny. I, I'm going to fall short of suggesting that we're inflating the numbers, but I am not going to back off the notion that there's inconsistency in how deaths are being uh, counted. And there's the question of, did you die of COVID or with COVID? And that difference of of it or with it makes a huge, huge difference. Mm -hmm. And so Ken alluded to it a moment ago. We have uh, some very aggressive oversight committee going, uh, committees going on right now, even through the summer when we're out of session. They actually met yesterday for four and a half hours. And this specific topic is on their list to uh, dig into. Uh, they have not done so yet, but I believe there is some vulnerability there of con inconsistencies. And uh, again, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna accuse anybody of padding numbers. I'm just saying it's time that we had to shed the the uh, full light on this topic because uh, we've all heard examples where people have died uh, of something that they know they were going to die of, yet they were recorded as dying of COVID. And uh, I, we need to prove it first, Veronica, before we start making those claims that we but we yeah, must let me just we must peel back that onion. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for two reasons. Number one is that we we just need to understand what's going on out there. We know the truth about, you know, the average age of somebody dying of COVID, you know, with uh, comorbidity rates being very high, obesity being one of the factors. But but think about this for the future. Historically, you know, if uh, if our grandkids go in for a physical and, a, you know, you know, for the first time with a doctor and the doctor says, well, tell me about your family history. Did you have a, do you have a history of heart disease? Do you have a history of diabetes? Do you have a history of, of, a, of some cancer? And you say, no, all my, you know, you know my uh, uh, grandparents all died of COVID. What does that tell you in terms of healthcare? And, and so these are, these are real serious questions that we're gonna have to, we are gonna have to peel back these layers to get to. Okay, thank you. Another question. Um, are there any plans to offer free antibody tests across the state to see how many people have already had it? I think that data would help a lot of people feel more comfortable uh, moving around and sending their kids back to school. Uh, I'm not aware of any plans for that specific test yet. I also want to put, put some precaution on the table that the antibody tests that we've got so far have, have uh, not been as accurate as we'd hoped, and they're still being developed. Uh, but I, I agree with, with Lisa, I think the one, or whoever asked that question, I think that uh, that would be a very important uh, job, to, you know, strategy for us to deploy. Uh, but it's not, I don't think it's ready yet. And right now we're just testing people, uh, you know, whether they have symptoms or not. Yeah, thank you. Um, it, here's one of interest, and, and yesterday the Saginaw County Chamber, along with some of our colleagues, signed on to some legislation being advanced by the Michigan Chamber of Commerce. And so the question is, what's happening with liability for business with regard to COVID in bringing people back to work and children back to school? Uh, we are aggressively uh, advancing legislation, not just for business owners and protecting them from liability, but also actually enhancing some of this uh, school liability coverage. For instance, you know, if we're going to expect uh, teachers and bus drivers to uh, enforce the use of masks and so forth, we need to provide them the same, same kind of immunity uh, protection so that they don't get in trouble if, if a certain parent thinks that they've, uh, they've overstepped their bounds, for instance. Mm -hmm. And so immunity across the board, not just in businesses, but across the board. Uh, we've already did that for the healthcare workers. We reaffirmed healthcare workers liability, and uh, I believe the governor signed that one, actually, thankfully. Uh, so it's a high priority, Veronica, and I'm, I'm a, I appreciate the, the caller asking that question. Okay, and now we have another one that's a bit controversial with some of my members. The governor announced that bias training will be required for medical professionals to renew their licenses. Who is administering this program, and what is the cost to Michigan for this? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to say, don't get me started. But uh, uh, this one, this one really, I hope it's a relatively friendly audience, but this one really ticks me off. Um, let's not debate the fact that there are disparate outcomes. There are. But let's not conclude that it's be because of implicit bias. And to, put, to cast that pall across all of our healthcare workers in particular, to me, is shameful at the very least. And uh, right now, that's the way that's being set up. It'll be done through the Department of Licensing, so our, our, our Lara, who will be then promulgating rules. 
And then the legislature will have an opportunity to input our uh, say in that through the, it's a rules process review is what it is. I'm not gonna get into the details of it. Okay. But, but it is a very dangerous road to go down. Uh, Ken has heard, heard me say this many, many times. I'm a strong believer in you always find what you're looking for. And dang it, if we're setting up the expectation that we're gonna find bias, that's precisely what we're gonna find, but it's not there. And for us to cast that, that, uh, that, that uh, model across our healthcare workers who have been working their butts off uh, for the last five months, it's just, it's ridiculous in my mind. And uh, we're gonna be, you know, we're gonna do everything we can to uh, mute this in, in the proper way. Yeah, and you know, and just I would just add, you know, there we, Makes you know, we've had our community conversations. The you know, the bishops breakfast, um, you know, talking about you know, talking about some of the issues about race in you know, in in, in Saginaw County area, and we will continue those conversations. And they and they have to be honest. They have to be unfiltered, raw, and the community has to come together. But for the governor to to take a broad brush and take uh, you know, I, you know, community heroes, these frontline workers, and then turn them into heels overnight, you know, suggesting that they're, you know, that they're biased in, in the work that they do. I think they take their Hippocratic oath very seriously. And, you know, and this is one of the flaws of having a, having a state of emergency with no oversight by, by the people of the state of Michigan. Thank you. And I, I can tell you, we heard from a number of our healthcare professional members that they were heroes three weeks ago and then racist today mm -hmm. and you know i guess the other question is you know who do you know who she well they haven't promulgated the rules yet so we don't even know who's going to bear the cost of paying for this implicit bias training right would it fall on the backs of hospitals and the businesses themselves mm -hmm. taxpayers yeah. are going to pay for it one way or the other taxpayers are going to pay for it there's not going to be you know it's no free lunch Okay. And who's going to who's going to design the training? For heaven's sakes, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, this this was a this is a very dangerous road that uh, is is on our radar screen right now. The budget is a higher priority. School startup is a higher priority, but this is going to be close behind it because it's it's an indication uh, that uh, I, that uh, I believe we're st we're going to we're in for similar kinds of things with this governor for the rest of her term. And it's just yeah, going to be know, that kind of uh, that that kind of confront. You know, and we had prior in 2019, we had set a very clear, um, you know, uh, agenda of priorities, and and I mean, it was going to be uh, car insurance reform. It was going to be uh, fixing our roads. It was going to it was going to be having a budget on time, you know, and balanced, and and those priorities just changed overnight on, on us with this with this virus and 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 I think how Michigan responded to it is much different than South Dakota for example responded to this you know if you know if you don't trust your people you're going to give them orders and if you trust your people you're going to give them information and you know and and we're going to and we're going to solve this together and that's really the uh, you know the key difference in what we're fighting for you know from the legislative side thank you I don't see a lot of new questions popping up here, so I'm gonna give each of you an opportunity to tell us anything else you'd like us to know and before we uh, finish up our perk. Senator, what's in, what's in store for us when we get back into session? So when we get back in session this, uh, this coming week, uh, we are gonna be focusing on finalizing the budget for this year and also, uh, I hope, if we can reach a con uh, agreement with a couple of uh, remaining details yeah, through the work that you were participated in on the education front, send some bills to the governor related to school startup, defining, for instance, how counts are done and things like that. And those are the primary objectives that we have uh, in, the, in the session for the re remainder of the summer. In the fall, we're going to go back to where our priorities were, Kenny. You know, and uh, we again, we have to tra make this transition from being in fear of this, getting rid of the fear and learning to live with it. And then and we can have that filter, but we don't need to jettison our other priorities that you've already identified and outlined. Roads is still a, infrastructure is still a big deal, big deal for us. So is economic development. Uh, 
Uh, so as Zach said, uh, those other uh, technology features that really are drivers for our economy these days, all of those st have to come back to be top uh, priorities on our agendas. And because if they don't, then we're not doing our job. Yeah, and from my perspective, you know, chairing Economic Development Committee and some of the others that, you know, I have uh, this array of committees that that I've been appointed to, that all revolve around really economic development and growth of the state of Michigan. So, education and career readiness. These are this you know this is a really integral part of the you know of economic development and we're going to have to count on our schools and our colleges and our universities to such a degree for training or you know, getting back into this I, I had a chance to chat with the michigan manufacturers association yesterday and their biggest worry is is cash flow within 120 days because they're up and running but they're not getting paid and and so we're you know you know and then when they don't get paid what happens they have to scale back and and so do, are we gonna see layoffs? What's the unemployment rate gonna look like? Is Pure Michigan gonna come back? The growing pro talent fund, the skill trades training, is that, are we gonna be reinstituting that? Will we have the money for it? Uh, the reconnect program that I am, you know, it, one of the things that I'm working closely with the governor's office on and have been from the beginning, uh, you know, finding those people with, you know, 25 years uh, uh, older, older, with no post-secondary, no training in anything, they have a high school diploma, how do we get them back into the, you know, back into the workforce, uh, trained and ready to go? You know, and, and if I don't get this economy rolling, you know, for the state of Michigan, if we don't get it rolling, then all of the, the tax revenues. Think about, you know, we've talked about this a little bit before in some of our leadership groups, Veronica and Lisa, the, uh, we had TRW left us a few years ago. You remember we were at the at Joanne at the at the ribbon cutting when they when they repurposed a, you know an empty plant, and then they had a contract with General Motors out of our control. They're gone. Three hundred people. If a, you know they leave, they took all of their income tax revenues with them, all of their for the city of Saginaw and you know the state of Michigan. All of their sales tax revenue, because they're buying cars in Ohio now where they're working, not, you know, not Garber, not Schaefer Beer Line, you know, not McDonald's. And, and, and so the sales tax revenue is not coming into our schools. Yeah. You know, they're, uh, and the property values, you know, plummet, you know, plummet because they're leaving houses behind, you know, and, and then, and more importantly, they're leaving, they be, they're leaving with their Blue Cross cards. And so our hospitals don't, you know, you know, are, are reimbursed by Medicaid at three, you know, 30 cents on a dollar, whatever. Yeah. You multiply this by tens of thousands of times. That, you know, that scenario in the state of Michigan, that was the lost decade. And are we facing that again? And so this is what we're, we are desperately trying to avoid, you know, right. for the state of Michigan and for this region. And, and so all the help that you can give us because, you know, from the private sector to the public sector who depends on, you know, on this economy, you know, we're all in this boat together. And so uh, we're trying to strive to, you know, to make this, this is an economic e ecosystem and that root system has to be really, really strong. And Saginaw has been on the forefront. And, and so I'm so proud of, you know, our chamber of commerce and, and, um, and, and frankly, you the work that you and your staff do, honey. So, so I, I think we're, we're going to be okay. It's just going to take a little time. I, th I, uh, I, I continue, Veronica, to admire the work that uh, the, the Saginaw Bay Area has accomplished in terms of, you know, locking arm in arms with each other and getting through what's been a very difficult time. I see Lisa had a couple of questions early on that I can see that you may not be able to see. I want to, I want to address uh, both of them. Sure. Her, her one question was, what's the status of our lawsuit, the, the, uh, the uh, legislature's lawsuit against the governor? Um, we uh, sued the governor for, uh, for inappropriate interpretation of laws and the abuse of the uh, Emergency Managing Acts, too, both of them. Uh, we went to the Court of Claims and got a split decision. Uh, the judge there agreed with us on one front, but disagreed on the other. It's now in the hands of the Court of Appeals. The Supreme Court has told the Court of Appeals that they must rule by August 20th and must hear all their all the appeals uh, by August 28th. And then by all accounts, then the Supreme Court is going to take it up and hear our suit, 
plus another very similar suit early in September. And so I wished it was sooner than that, um, uh, but at least we know there's a, there's a cadence now and the Supreme Court is engaged in, in driving it. Um, I don't know if this is appropriate or not. Uh, if, if you mute me, if I'm, if I, if it's not appropriate, but there's, there's also a very, in, very important citizen initiative being going on right now. It's called Unlock Michigan, and you can, you can observe it by going to unlockmichigan.com. It's all one word, unlockmichigan.com, and that citizen initiative is to collect the signatures to, for citizens to then repeal the law that's being abused. It's not a legislative driven process, this is citizens. And it's, we've, uh, I've been, I'm part of the, uh, the, uh, the support structure for that, but it's not being driven by the legislature. And in the first week, we have requests for 50,000 petitions to be sent out for signatures to be gathered. And I would encourage everybody on this call that if you're like-minded uh, to uh, understanding how this has, has really affected our lifestyles, not just our economy, but our lifestyles, uh, to, to go to unlockmichigan.com and, uh, and consider signing up, getting a petition, circulating a petition, and, and let's, uh, we could appreciate that effort. And then the last question that I see Lisa asked here was regarding funds being distributed to schools and the, the uh, question about whether it's being shared with public and private schools. Um, on the topic of PPE and the topic of requiring uh, the requirements of uh, federal government and the state government on using uh, personal uh, protection equipment and so forth, we did distribute that broadly, including both public and private schools. That's separate and distinctly different than the per pupil funding. And so I didn't want to, I didn't want to mislead anybody there on that one. We did include uh, private schools. Well, I'm going to wrap this just, up real, I'm you know, sorry, go ahead. You know, let me just add, yeah, before we wrap up, just let me add something on Unlock Michigan, too, uh, that we are working right now a, with the state of emergency under the 1945, you know, I, you heard it called the War Powers Act, I've heard it called the Riot Act of 1945. No 1945 law ought to be, ought to be uh, managing a 2020 uh, crisis. And, and so the people have the chance to stand up, uh, sign the petition, if you're so inclined, and then, uh, and then send it to the legislature. We, uh, we can uh, approve it with a simple majority, and if people act as the, uh, as the administration on, on this part, no governor's signature is required. And then we get together with the governor, and then we, uh, and then we uh, create a, a law for the future that says, uh, that says, when this happens, here's what we are going to do together. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you. Um, I, I think we're already over time now by three minutes. And so, Crystal, I'm, I'm sorry we didn't get to your question. Um, but I know that both uh, Senator Shirky and Ken are available maybe to answer that offline. Um, and it's really why is the MDHHS, Michigan.gov website, COVID graph and table not include Detroit data? This is skewing mm. the numbers to the low side. Mm. Okay. So, um, anyway, I want to thank both Senate Majority Leader Shirky and uh, Senator Horn for joining us today. This information is really important as businesses plan for the future. Now to wrap things up, I'd like to take just a minute to thank this morning's Chamber Ambassador crew. They help us rehearse our transition to all these virtual events, and they were happy to volunteer as discussion leaders in today's breakout room. So thank you all. Chamber ambassadors are, we have the best of the state, I'm telling you. I wanna thank our chamber board chair, chairwoman Heather Gallegos for helping me emcee today's program. We're learning all new skills these days, believe me. <laughs> and I appreciate the support of all of you participating in our virtual perk. The chamber greatly appreciates the support and participations of our sponsors. Once again, without them, we couldn't provide the services and events that bring us together to communicate, connect, and influence our way to a thriving business economy. Our next virtual perk on August 6th will be very interesting. We will honor our small business sponsors and feature a look at Saginaw County Schools as they work to educate our children in the midst of an unprecedented difficulties. I wanna thank you again for joining us and hope you enjoy the rest of the day. We are adjourned. <laughs>